Live from the campus of Francis Marion University, WBTW News 13, The Morning News, and SCNow.com present the 2010 South Carolina gubernatorial debate. For more than 30 years, Chapman Auditorium has served as a center of instruction at Francis Marion University. Tonight, politics is the subject as we put the two major party candidates for governor of South Carolina to the test. A good evening to you and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Bob Juback with WBTW News 13. For our viewers who are watching locally in the PD and on the Grand Strand of South Carolina, also across the nation on C-SPAN and online at SCNow.com, we welcome you to this beautiful campus. A capacity audience of more than 400 people is here, are here tonight. For this, it's the third in our series of the Voice of the Voter debates that are sponsored by both Francis Marion and Coastal Carolina Universities. And we're pleased to have the two major party candidates who seek to become South Carolina's 116th governor. First, the Republican nominee tonight, State Representative Nikki Haley from Lexington. And... And the Democratic nominee, State Senator Vincent Shaheen from Camden. Also, a panel of esteemed journalists will help question the candidates tonight. First of all, Capitol reporter Robert Kittle has covered politics for News 13 for more than two decades. He serves as chairman of the State House Press Corps and oftentimes has been named the best TV State House reporter in the entire country. Also, Morning News Metro editor Jackie Torek has covered South Carolina's PD region for more than 15 years. And our third panel, uh, panelist is Rusty Ray. He is with News 13, has been a member of WBTW's news team since 2002. He anchors WBTW's morning newscast and also our popular Positively Carolina reports. We also welcome them as well. Tonight's debate is going to consist of five rounds. The first four will feature three questions per round from our media panel. Then in rounds one, four, and five, I'll ask a question submitted as part of our Voice of the Voter project. Now in rounds two and three, the student government presidents from both Francis Marion and Coastal Carolina universities will each ask the candidates a question. The candidates whose turn it is to answer a question will have one minute and 45 seconds to answer. The other candidate then gets 45 seconds for a rebuttal. A coin toss determine which candidate goes first tonight. Robert Kittle has the first question for Ms. Haley. Representative Haley, South Carolina is facing a $1 billion budget shortfall next year, as you know. Since education and health care combined account for about 75% of the budget, what specifically would you do to cut $1 billion out of the budget, especially considering the fact that a big part of the health care budget is Medicaid, which by federal law the state cannot cut? Well, first of all, Robert, it, there's a great opportunity in that we have a billion dollar deficit and we have to see that is any time a business goes through the hardest times, they make the best decisions. So what we need to do is look at every single agency, start at zero, say what do we have to have and work our way up. When we talk about health care, we need to understand that in our health care services agencies, we have twice as many secretaries as we do nurses. We've got to look at streamlining to what we absolutely have to have. When it comes to education, we need to acknowledge the fact that we're too top heavy. We've got too many administrators and not enough of the dollars going to the teacher and student in the classroom. So we've got to look at that. But the key way of doing that is to go to every single agency, tell them that we have to do certain reforms by the end of the year and make sure that we get that done. This is all about taking the opportunity of saying, what do we have to have? Government was intended to secure the rights and freedoms of the people. It was never intended to be all things to all people. We will privatize workforce centers. We will privatize school bus systems. We're one of the only states in the country not doing that. We will find things that government doesn't need to pay for and create the opportunity to where we can have the private sector do it better. And in return, we will have a stronger and more competitive government because of it. Mr. Shaheen, 45 seconds. Thank you. I think the key is to have some specifics. We can't have multiple accounting departments in state agencies anymore. Uh, we can't have multiple human resource departments. We can't have a budget control board that's operating administrative functions in South Carolina's government. It's going to be, have to be folded and streamlined uh, into the executive branch. 
But this is a great opportunity to shift the way we think about budgeting as well. We have to create a programmatic budget. I'm not just saying that because I'm running for governor. I've pushed for a programmatic budget for the last four years. This is the year to do it. A programmatic budget requires the legislature and the governor and agencies to give objective criteria to measure the successes, the successes and the output of any program. And if an agency can't give us a criteria, an objective criteria to measure it by, we can't have that program. We have limited dollars, ladies and gentlemen. We have to be smart in how we spend them. Jackie Tork, your next question is for Mr. Shaheen. Yeah, Senator Shaheen, U.S. Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood, during his recent visit to Florence, pointed to South Carolina's State Infrastructure Bank as a model for a national infrastructure bank. Um, and I understand that it will be pitched in Washington in January. As governor, will you support a national infrastructure bank and then make sure I-73 is among the first project it funds? I will. I will, and I do. Let me take this first full question I have, though, to step back a moment and say thank you to Francis Marion. Thank you to Coastal for hosting us in this debate. I want to thank all of you for being here and participating, but I especially want to thank my wife, Amy, who's been with me for the last year and a half and the last 15 years uh, of our marriage. I'm excited about the opportunity for the federal government to have an infrastructure bank modeled on South Carolina's. Uh, Secretary LaHood also said that they needed a governor who would support I-73. I support I-73. I have supported it for the last four years. I have supported resolutions about I-73 uh, to get the support we need in the legislature. We have to have a governor who will convene the other governors in this country who, are, who will have an input into I-73. I will do that. We have to have a governor who will support the creation of a national infrastructure bank. Otherwise, I-73 is not going to be able to be funded. This is a distinct difference between my opponent and myself. I am willing to say that I will do what it takes to have I-73. That may mean tolling I-73. It may mean public-private partnerships. But we have to explore all these opportunities so that we can make I-73 a reality. The next Secretary of Transportation, when I appoint him or her, will be on the same page as I am and will support I-73. The amount of job creation that is projected to come from successful I-73 uh, project is staggering. Thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs. When I've had the opportunity to vote to support I-73, I have. My opponent voted against a resolution, uh, I think this year, uh, that supported I-73 and would have allowed for public partnerships, public-private partnerships, and tolling of I-73 if necessary. If we're serious about it, we're going to have to partner with the federal government to make it happen. Ms. Haley. Thank you. First of all, I have always been a supporter of I-73 and will continue to be. Infrastructure is at the heart of economic development. We have to understand that when companies come to South Carolina, they look for three things. They look for a tax structure that allows them to get cash flow and profit margin. They look for a skilled workforce and they look for infrastructure, which is roads, dual rail, competitive airfare, and strong ports. I do support I-73. What I didn't support this year is the tolling of I-73. We are not going to tax people for this road. If we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. My opponent is exactly right. We differ on this. He would support a national infrastructure bank just like he supported national Obamacare. That's not what we need. That is going in blindly without knowing what's in the bill. I will go to our federal delegation. I will say we have to have I-73, just like we have to have the dredging for the ports. It doesn't matter to me how they go about doing it, but we will get it done. And as governor, my, my main concern is to make sure that I bring that economic development to South Carolina. I just want to clear one thing up, Ms. Haley, though. Through a representative in Myrtle Beach, they said that you supported tolling. Now you're saying you're against tolling. No, I have never supported tolling, and that's why I voted against that bill. I do not support tolling. I would like to know how the state is going to provide funding for I-73 if we're not going to increase the gas tax, which I don't think you, you believe should happen, and nor do I, uh, and you're not going to support tolling. The state is going to have to provide some funds to it. Senator, I don't believe in taxes like you do. What I think is that we go through the federal delegation and we make sure this is not a small project. You want, federal, we, you want, you want to me, bring I'm federal money. I'm trying to answer the question. You want to bring federal this money. is not about um, just $100 million, which we already have for I-73. I-73 is going to cost $2.5 billion. We can't earmark that to death and wait every single year to get another $100 million. This has got to be part where the federal delegation decides we have to have it. They go and they find out exactly where we're going to get it from, but we are not going to be part of a huge national 
bill, just like we're a part of the national health care mandate, because all we see is that taxes everybody for everything. We have to be smart about this. And I will work directly with the delegation. We are not going to do random taxes. We are not going to do random earmarks. We're going to do this right. And that takes care of the citizens of this state, and it also makes sure that we get I-73. And I have talked with Senator Graham about this. We are going to continue to move forward, and I-73 will be a reality in South Carolina. You know, I hear always, she always throws out mandates. She knows full well I don't support mandates in health care. She just throws it in even when the question doesn't relate to it because she likes to distract people from what we're trying to talk about. The truth is, you can't just say we're going to get it done. You know, Mark Sanford has been saying we're going to get it done for eight years, and I haven't seen I-73 move very far down the road. You have to have some specifics. Here's some specifics. Number one, we ought to have a federal infrastructure bank. Number two, we know the state's going to have to match that. How are we going to do it? I haven't heard anything from Representative Haley. I can tell you what should be on the table. Tolling of I-73 has to be on the table, and public-private partnerships have to be on the table. One won't do it without the other. We're either going to be honest in this debate, and we're going to talk about ways that we honestly can move South Carolina forward, or we're going to pretend, just like we've pretended for the last eight years, that things will just happen. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen, things don't just happen. Well, and Senator, I would agree. We do need to be honest, and I think you need to be honest that it was the Sun News that said that you supported Obamacare, so I think that you need to stand up to that. And I also think that we are being honest when you say I'm not Mark Sanford. I know you want me to be, but I'm not. And so I think that we have to be realistic in the fact that the question was about I-73. Right. I absolutely support it, and we'll make sure that we get it. Next question, Rusty Ray to Representative Haley. Right, we'll change topics just a little bit. Uh, Representative, some lawmakers in Columbia advocate a stronger immigration law in South Carolina, similar to the law passed in Arizona that we've heard so much about. Do you support the tighter scrutiny on suspects by law enforcement who may believe a suspect is in this country illegally? And do you think there needs to be a different standard other than an officer's judgment in the heat of the moment? What I can tell you is that, you know, everyone has compared the immigration law to Arizona. If I get the immigration Arizona law, I absolutely will sign it. Arizona did what they had to because the federal government failed to act. We have a South Carolina immigration reform bill, but it's not as strong as the Arizona law. And I will tell you that the problem with the South Carolina bill is that it doesn't allow us to actually go and take illegal aliens. We are only allowed to call Homeland Security, whereas Arizona allows Homeland Security to actually come in and take the illegals. It also says any illegals that are caught carrying weapons, carrying any or uh, uh, carrying drugs or committing a terrorist act would be considered a felony. South Carolina doesn't do that and Arizona does. I will also tell you when given the opportunity to fund illegal immigration, Senator Shaheen did not fund it. Instead, he he chose to support the stimulus package while I chose to support funding prosecution for illegal immigration. We have to get serious about illegal immigration. SLED has said that we have gangs and drug cartel that are going straight from Mexico to Atlanta and coming through South Carolina as they get to Charlotte. I am not going to wait for us to become victims of the process. We're going to be very strong on that. While we are a country of immigrants, we are a country of laws. When you give up being a country of laws, you give up everything this country was founded on. Senator Shaheen. Uh, I support South Carolina's immigration bill. Representative Haley back in April said that two years ago we passed one of the strongest illegal immigration bills in the country. This legislature passed this amazing illegal immigration reform bill. I voted for that bill. The focus of that bill is cracking down on employers who employ illegal immigrants. That's what we need to do in South Carolina. If we enacted Arizona's bill wholesale, it would weaken South Carolina's immigration bill. I won't support that. If there are provisions that would toughen up our bill, I will support it. For example, I do believe that law enforcement should be able to call in uh, the federal authorities, as Representative Haley just said, if they have reason to suspect that somebody is here uh, illegally. But we're not going to weaken South Carolina's bill just so Representative Haley can run for governor of the United States. We need to worry about South Carolina, and I'm running for the governor of South Carolina because I care about South Carolina. And we did put funding in to support the immigration bill. In right, fact, labor you, license and regulation is doing it today. All right. Thank you, Senator is much tougher and the difference that makes it tougher is it allows our law enforcement to arrest right then and there. The bill that South Carolina has requires them to go through training which costs government expenses which we don't have. 
Two years right. ago, we did have the strongest bill in the state, in the country. But right now, Arizona's is the strongest, and I think we absolutely need to support it. Thank you, Ms. Haley. Voice of our voter question right now, it comes from Jeff Gardner. And Jeff asked, and this is going to go to Senator Shaheen, what are you going to do about the current job market, especially in the PD region of South Carolina? For those of you watching nationally, it's the northeastern part of the state. It just seems that all the new jobs being created are going to other parts of the state. What are you going to do to change that? Thank you for that question. You know, in the state senate, I represent one of the counties in the PD, Chesterfield, and used to represent Marlboro. I know well that the PD, frankly, has been ignored by this administration. And my commitment to the PD is the same commitment I make to the rest of South Carolina. And that is that you will have a governor who will travel this nation, travel this world to recruit jobs and industry back into our state. It's not good enough just to sit back and think things are gonna happen. And that's what's happened for the last eight years. I will push jobs into the PD, just like I'll push jobs throughout the rest of the state. I want to rebuild that partnership between the Commerce Department and the local development offices. I've spent the last year visiting entrepreneurs and small businesses throughout this state to learn about what they need to be successful. I want to be that governor who, again, believes it's the governor's top priority to recruit business and industry into South Carolina. I want to help to reform our tax code. We have a very convoluted tax code that places an increasing burden on small business in property taxes. I voted against an act that was passed a few years ago, Act 388, which put a tremendous burden of property tax on small business throughout South Carolina, including the PD. I want the PD to be a part of our economic development plan because counties like Marion, counties like Dillon cannot survive having 18 and 19 percent unemployment. I'm committed to this area just like I'm committed to the rest of the state. Ms. Haley. Thank you. You know, we have to understand that we do have 11% unemployment, but while we have 11% unemployment, we also have 54,000 open jobs that our South Carolina businesses need to fill, and they're going out of state and out of country to get it. That's a South Carolina problem. We have to understand that when we bring in jobs, we need to bring in good quality jobs. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to have a tax structure that allows them to make profits and cash flow. Because when you give businesses cash flow, the first thing they do is hire people. We have to make sure we're taking care of our small businesses. The way you do that is through a good business environment. I will tell you that the bill that Senator Shaheen is referring to, it gave a 60% tax reduction to primary homes for, for residents. I voted for that tax relief. That was a great bill. He voted against it and that's unfortunate. But what I will tell you is the way to get to businesses and the way to support businesses through workers' comp reform and getting objective standards, that's what they need. It's through tort reform where you go to a loser pay system and you cap non-medical damages. It's through tax reform where you give small businesses cash flow and, and bottom lines. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Haley. Our next question from Robert Kittle goes to Senator Shaheen. Senator, I'd like to talk more about this looming state budget crisis. If it's not possible to cut $1 billion from the state budget without eliminating entire state agencies or severely hurting things like schools, health care, and law enforcement, that leaves raising taxes of some kind. Are you willing to raise taxes to prevent massive cuts to vital services, or is any kind of tax increase completely off the table? I don't believe we can afford to raise taxes on people in South Carolina right now. My opponent has talked about raising the food tax. I think that's exactly the wrong approach to have. She'll deny it now, but she said it back in August pretty clearly. Uh, we can't afford to raise taxes on working South Carolinians because people are suffering right now. I'll tell you, it is important that we are real about the budget situation. It is critical. There will be cuts this year. There were cuts this past year. We have to prioritize, and my priorities are the job-creating agencies like Commerce, public education, but we will still see difficult times ahead. I supported increasing the cigarette tax last year, and now my opponent is running a TV commercial <coughs> accusing me of raising taxes on families. Now, you know, if raising the cigarette tax is raising taxes on families, we've got a big problem in South Carolina. But that's just how she's run this campaign. I'm not afraid to do what's right. I'm not afraid to do what's right regardless of the consequences. It was right to raise the lowest in the nation's cigarette tax to help stem teenage smoking to help make sure we had the dollars necessary to run the functions of state government, to make sure that people who were criminals didn't keep coming into South Carolina, buying cigarettes and smuggling them out on the black market. But I don't think we can afford to raise taxes on South Carolinians uh, in general this year. I think it would be a big mistake and I won't support it. 
Ms. Haley. You know, what we need to do is understand that if we reform Medicaid, every state averages about 10% abuse in the system. So we need to really kind of tackle that bear we don't want to tackle. So I think Medicaid is hugely important. We've got to look at education and understand that it's all about going, dollars going to the teacher, student, and technology in the classroom. And there's a lot of overhead waste. We're spending $11,000 a year to educate a child in this state. It's going through 1,000 people at the Department of Education and 85 school districts before it ever touches that teacher and student in the classroom. Yet we're only graduating graduating one out of every two kids. We've got to make sure that we are streamlining what we do and how we do it. It's about bringing good quality jobs to this state. But I will tell you this, in terms of the grocery tax, I voted for the elimination of the grocery tax. My opponent voted for it. I wasn't just talking about raising taxes on cigarettes. You've raised taxes on a lot of things. Um, but what I will tell you is we will get a 10-year business plan. So it's not just survival for this year. It's making sure that when we come out of this, we're more competitive and stronger in the end. You know, if I could just respond, because sometimes you tell the character of a person by the little things they say that just flat out aren't true. And one of the weirdest things about this campaign is Representative Haley's insistence on saying things that aren't true. Last night she said there were 1,100 employees at the Department of Education. Tonight she says there are 1,000. The truth is, and she knows it, but she keeps saying 1,000 just because it sounds cool, is there's 883, and about half of them are bus mechanics. You know, it's important that we talk the truth when we're having these debates. Otherwise, we're never going to move this state forward in any kind of rational way. We've got to be honest about this debate. Senator, there are 1,179 employees in the Department of Education. Yes, many of them are school bus mechanics, which is why I think we need to privatize the school bus system. You know, I asked the Department of Education today how many employees there were because it gets old hearing people say things that aren't true. And this is what, as of September 1st, 2010, the agency had 883 employees. That's the truth. I looked she, at the budget, and it budgets for, the budget is for 1,179 okay, employees, and that's what we're paying for. Right. You understand that they're authorized to have 1,179, but they, in fact, don't because they have had to cut back on the number of people there. Can but let's just speak the truth. Can we agree that even if it's 1,000 or 883, it's too many? It's, I'd rather uh, you that tell me which the ones, Tell me which one. I would much, you know that my platform is to push the dollars into the classroom. Actually, I want you to talk specific, and I want you to tell me which positions we need to let go because I can't tell whether or not we should unless you tell me what they actually do. I want to privatize school bus systems because we'll I think we have it, 16 to 17 year old school buses. We could have three to four year old school buses. The school bus systems, if you ever looked into it, when you privatize a school bus system, they hire your school bus people, but they, we don't have to have all those maintenance people. We don't have to maintain those school buses so it's more efficient. And Senator, you don't believe in more dollars going to the classroom because in the budget this past year, you voted against moving the percentage from 60 65% going into the classroom as opposed to the 55% that we have now. You voted against 65% of the dollars now, going to the classroom. Now, my understanding is that 70% of the dollars go into the classroom right now, but you don't include in the right. classroom principles, right? The and amendment you, you voted you include, against would have increased it. You don't include it. cooks. Right? Let's the get on to the next question. Okay. It to you want the teachers to cook, and you want the teachers you to prepare the You didn't answer the question, Senator. <laughs> next question. Jackie Torek to Rep uh, Representative Haley. All right, as long as we're talking about schools. Um, you, Senator, or Rep Representative Haley, um, in the past you've proposed doing away with college and university boards, eliminating college campuses, and ending university-tied economic development. How specifically is that going to preserve existing jobs and create new ones? You know, what I've had the opportunity to do is to talk to a lot of presidents and school boards around the state and just say, if we've got this issue of funding, how do we fix it? The way I think we need to do is I think we need to acknowledge first where is the problem coming from and where do we need to go with the solution. Right now we basically fund colleges based on football tickets, legislative alumni, and lobbyists in the state house. That's not the way to fund education. What I want to do is make sure that when we fund a school, just send them the money. Don't tell them how they have to spend it. Because Francis Marion is not like Clemson. Clemson's not like College of Charleston. And they need to spend it in the way that's going to make their school strong. And then at the end of the year, go to measurables. Ask them, what's the dollars in the classroom? What's your in-state versus out-of-state? What were your graduation rates? And what did you do for economic development? And at that point, take those measurables to the legislature and say that's how you fund a college. Those colleges that did great, let's brag about them and let's give them more money. Those colleges that didn't just got challenged and incentivized to do better and it's better for the taxpayer. It puts more control in the hands of the college and allows the students and the families to feel better about the tuition that they're paying. Mr. Shaheen. 
Thank you. I think the question was, do you support abolishing all the boards of trustees? And it would be nice to hear Representative Haley's answer once I get done. Uh, I think we need to have an empowered commission on higher education, but no, I don't think we need to abolish all the boards of trustees. I think there's an important role for boards of trustees to play in governing the institutions uh, of higher education in South Carolina. We have in this state disinvested in higher education over the last 10 years, and the result has been a doubling and a tripling of tuition at many colleges and universities. The next governor has to make a commitment that over the long term, when the budget recovers, we will commit a higher percentage of the state budget to higher education so we can stabilize tuition and make sure that our students, our children, our young people, our young adults have the best opportunities to succeed and to grow this economy. In the meantime, the colleges and universities are going to have to tighten their belts because we can't have this tuition going up and up and up. All right. Thank you, Senator. Next question, Rusty Ray to Senator Shaheen. Senator, you support the new insurance program swept in by the president's health care reform, including the part that requires the state to pay an extra $20 million in health insurance to its employees. In these budget times that we've already talked about a little bit here, how would you propose that the state pay for this extra millions of dollars of coverage? I don't support uh, unfunded mandates on state government. I don't support mandates uh, on individuals, and I don't support uh, any increased burdens placed on small businesses. So if there are increased burdens on state government, then the federal government ought to pay for it or it ought not to be in place. And I will advocate strongly. Now there is a difference between myself and, and my opponent. Because I'll tell you, I believe it's important that young children who are born with pre-existing conditions are covered by health insurance. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. I'll tell you a quick story. I have a nephew named David. In fact, his mother, my sister Margaret, is here today. David was born with a heart defect. Now, Margaret and her husband, they were lucky enough to have an insurance policy that allowed for pre-existing conditions. But there are thousands of kids out there who aren't. And I believe in my Christian faith very deeply that what we do to the least of these, we do for him. And I couldn't look Margaret in the face. I couldn't look my family in the face. I couldn't go to church on Sunday morning if I didn't support provisions that allow children with pre-existing conditions to be covered in health insurance. Or provisions that say to a woman who has breast cancer, but whose costs are very high, that she's going to be kicked off her insurance policy. You know, to Representative Haley, this is a political game and a political football. There are things I don't like in the federal health care legislation, and I have said that consistently. And as governor, I will stand up against them. But if there are good things, like covering pre-existing conditions for children who are born with heart defects, like little David, or if there are good things, like women with breast cancer who won't get kicked off their policy, then we ought to try to make those things work. Ms. Haley? Senator, you can't split the cow. The people didn't have the opportunity to say we like this part of the health care mandate, not this one. It is coming down. It is going to cost the people of South Carolina $1 billion. Anyone that doesn't participate, it's going to cost you $700 or 2.5% of your income, whichever is greater. We can't sustain that. I not only will fight this health care mandate, I will get a coalition of governors that says we do not support this. Instead, let us incentivize our small businesses to offer health care. Let us pass tort reform that goes to a loser pay system and caps on medical damages. Let us reform Medicaid. And what we need from the federal government is allow insurance companies to cross state lines so that we can get affordable, efficient health care. But Obamacare is not something you can support. And you can't say you like parts of it, not other parts. We're stuck with the whole cow. And we've got to stick there and make sure that we fight it back all the way to the Supreme Court. You know, we need a governor with the intelligence and the ability to say when things are good and when things are bad and who are willing to stand up to bad things but are willing to say if there's something good in it, then okay. we ought to try to make it work. I'm willing to stand up against mandates, and I will. All right, but our I'm next question to... comes from Shayla Williams. She's the student government president here at Francis Marion. Shayla is a senior majoring in elementary education. She's from Columbia. And Shayla, your question is for Representative Haley. Yes. Um, first and foremost, on behalf of the student body, let me thank both of you for being here. It is an honor and a privilege to have you here. Um, as a young South Carolinian pursuing a college education, I have um, typical debt, I have a part-time job, and when I graduate, I will have um, student loans to repay. I understand how important a bachelor's degree is to my um, future, and I'm dedicated to my education. What I would like to know um, is what specifically, two or three things that you plan to do that will benefit young South Carolinians like myself. 
Well, first of all, Shayla, thank you for having us, and we are very proud of you and what you are accomplishing. You know, the first thing that we have to do is we have to understand we've got a lot of graduates who aren't finding jobs. It is the reason why I think it's so important that we recruit good companies to this state. If you look at Boeing that just came to Charleston, we don't need a Boeing every 20 years. We need them more often, and I'll be very aggressive on that. I asked the executives of Boeing a couple weeks ago, how many of your contracts that you have are going to South Carolina businesses. They said 91%. That's our small, small businesses getting 91% of those contracts. That's jobs for you. That's things that I know we can take care of. My goal is to make sure we are a business friendly climate. We have a good tax structure. We make sure we have workers comp reform and tort reform. That we invite companies here. And I will make sure that we get all the companies we need to so that we can match you up. The second thing is making sure we've got good workforce centers for you. So when you get out into the job search, if you don't find something, you've got a privatized workforce center working with you to make sure that you get into the job that you want to. My goal is to keep you in South Carolina. I don't want to lose you. Mr. Shaheen. Thank you, and thank you for your question. And first, I'll tell you, please stay in South Carolina. We lose too many of our young people. In fact, we are losing way too many of our young professionals to our sister states of North Carolina and Georgia and Tennessee. And you know what? It's no surprise. Right now, we've been the butt of late night television jokes for year after year after year. As your governor, I will change that. I'll make you proud of your leadership again. I want you to also know that I'm committed to creating a division of entrepreneurship and small business within our Department of Commerce with the existing staff we have. Other states have done this. It can reach out and help young people who are starting businesses with business plans, can help link you into financing opportunities, can be there to help you navigate the sometimes difficult bureaucracies of state and federal government. I want to offer an opportunity to young entrepreneurs in South Carolina because they really are the future of this state. I'm proud of you. Stay here. All right, thank you, Senator. Thank you, Shayla, too. Robert Kittle has the next question for Representative Haley. You just mentioned Boeing. Uh, the incentives the state gave Boeing to bring it here will result in thousands of jobs, but you've been critical of those incentives. Where do you stand on offering big companies incentives to get them here like the state did with BMW and Boeing? And if you're against those, how would you attract those companies and their jobs? We're not ag against incentives. What you have to do is very much like a business plan. It's a cost-benefit analysis. We have to make sure that more of our small businesses benefit. The reason Boeing was great is not only are they here for the long term, they are going to already expand. We're already talking with them about expanding. But just like I said, 91% of their contracts are going to South Carolina businesses. That's something that needs to be negotiated on the front end. We need to make sure that it is our small businesses benefiting from those big corporations and we need to make sure that we are bringing in those good quality corporations that are going to stay here we have to keep relationships with them not just bringing them here but once they stay here and look to make sure that we're linking them up with technical colleges so that they're getting the skilled workforce that we need but what we don't want to do is bring in companies that take away South Carolina business and we've seen retail outlets and things like that come in I will always vote against things that take away from our own South Carolina small business I will always support things that bring in more jobs and help our South Carolina small businesses. Mr. Shaheen. Thank you. I will aggressively use incentives to recruit business and industry into South Carolina. I want to make sure those incentives have a bang for their buck and you measure that by jobs. But right now we've been allowing other states to out recruit South Carolina. We used to be the model for economic development and recruitment in the southeast and right now we're the best thing that other states have going for them. I'm going to change that. I was there to vote for the Boeing incentives package because I thought it was the most important economic development vote that we have had in a generation. I was there. Representative Haley did not show up that day to vote on that vote. It was important for us to be there. Boeing has the potential to spin off thousands of jobs all across the state, even up in the PD and up in the Midlands and Kershaw County uh, where I live. I'm excited about the opportunity of aggressively using uh, economic development incentives and being a governor who will be out there as the top economic developer and recruiter for South Carolina. All right. Thank you, Senator. Next question is uh, from Jackie Torek to Senator Shaheen. Senator Shaheen, there have been calls for attorneys who serve in the state legislature like yourself to recuse themselves from votes that have a direct impact on their paychecks. How can you reassure citizens that your actions as governor will not constitute a conflict of interest when it comes to matters like workers' compensation? Well, of course, I won't, once I'm governor, I won't be practicing law anymore. Right now, we have uh, a part-time legislature, uh, a legislature where we have our own occupations. I happen to practice law. Uh, Nikki Haley happens to work uh, as an accountant and also f worked for a government hospital over in Lexington County. Uh, there are times when there are issues uh, relating to the law. Well, every law we pass in the General Assembly 
uh, relates to the law. I recuse myself when the ethics laws tell me I'm supposed to recuse myself. For example, I recuse myself on voting for workers' compensation commissioners. But it's important that we have a citizen legislature. It's important that we have a part-time legislator. legislature. You know, Nikki has accused me of suing the state uh, oftentimes, but I'll tell you, the truth is, those cases that she refers to are really cases where my law firm was defending the state. And I think I've been proud that members of my law firm have defended the state. In fact, I believe there are two of those clients here. I didn't know them beforehand uh, when their case was going on, but Mr. and Ms. Blackman, are you here? Would you stand up? These two folks, their land was taken by the government. And they didn't hire me, but they did hire a member of my firm uh, to defend them. They worked their whole life, their whole life, to build a small business. And my understanding is that they hired my law firm, and my law firm defended them when the, governor came, the government came to take their land, and made sure that they got fair compensation that a jury decided. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. I don't apologize for that, and I'm not going to apologize for it. My opponent likes to bash on me for being a lawyer. You know what? I'd rather be a successful lawyer. I'd rather have a successful lawyer as my next governor than an accountant who didn't pay her taxes. Uh, Ms. Haley. He's successful, all right. Um, in the first two years of being in the Senate, he became the fifth highest paid attorney in workers' comp cases. Not only does he vote on the budget, to give workers comp. Not only does he work on subcommittees behind the scenes and then recuse himself in front, he goes and asks for the jobs from the state. He goes and works and sues businesses on the workers comp commission and that is the reason he actually sues our taxpayers and represents our taxpayers at the same time. He is a very successful trial lawyer. He has made lots of money doing that. Um, I will tell you that what I do think needs to happen and let's get to the issue is lawyer legislators. They should not be allowed to sit on these committees that appoint workers comp commissions. We need to have more business people on workers comp commissions and lawyers we need to make sure they can't have both their hands in both their pockets he has made hundreds of thousands of dollars by being a lawyer legislator that's one great part-time job all right thank you, you know, Ms. if i could just respond to that because i think it's important nikki haley before she was elected to legislature didn't have a job she then got work in her own county in a gut for a government hospital she then got work working for as a consulting contract for wilbur smith that has contracts with the state government you know, it gets a little bit old listening to her preach to me when I have followed the ethics laws, when I recuse myself when voting on commissioners, when she had jobs like Wilbur Smith that she was asked in a debate if she had reported the income and she misled the public. You cannot act that way any longer. You can't point the finger at somebody who has followed the rules, who has followed the ethics laws of South Carolina when you didn't. Senator, you have spent 80% of your advertising dollars attacking me, and every director of the Department of Revenue, every ethics commissioner has said I've done nothing wrong. I did have a great job working for my family's business, which they have had for 37 years. They are the heart of America. They are the reason I am running for governor. I did work for a hospital as an assistant executive director. I worked on their books. I changed the way they budgeted. I changed the way they did accounting. I have never made money off the state, nor did I work for a company that worked off the state. We worked and did private development in Lexington County, and I never once was involved with state contracts at all. I think that once again, I would ask you to stay on the issues. I think you have had a great time targeting me, but all you have done is misinform the public, but, but, and there's something very wrong with that. And for someone that cares a lot about trust, let's go through you, what, you've really let's go got through what's true and what's not. I think we need to go to the next question. I think question. it's important we do that. Well, I think it's important we do let's that. Let's go to the next question, because we're going to run out of time. Rusty Ray to uh, Representative Haley. Representative, year after year, South Carolina ranks near the top for the number of women killed by men in domestic violence situations. Can you say which steps that you would take, that you could take, you think, as governor to help reduce this number and these crimes? You know, I think it's something that's very sad. That's not something we want to be a involved in. I can tell you the Attorney General has done a masterful job at really trying to bring attention to this. We have to continue to have centers that help these women get out of the situation. I have talked many times about bringing faith-based organizations together to take care of so many of the things that we have in South Carolina that need help. Whether it's the poverty areas, whether it's after school programs or tutoring, it's also going to be to help women who are in those bad situations. It's going to be for counseling. We've got to give them the strength and know that they have a support group. It 
doesn't take government dollars to do that. But domestic violence is something that we need to take very seriously. We need to understand that as long as we have women out there that are suffering or men out there suffering, we cannot stop until we make sure they have the support system they need to get them out of the situation, strengthen law enforcement so that they can take the acts they need to and give the stiffest and most uh, harmful crimes to those people that do attend that do attempt those cases. Mr. Shaheen. Thank you. You know, I prosecuted cases against uh, spousal batters. I've seen it firsthand. I understand it firsthand. We need to continue to have stiff, stiff penalties on domestic violence. And we also need to make sure that we break that cycle. It is a very real cycle. And that includes penalties that require uh, domestic violence counseling for any batterers. It is including penalties that require jail sentences for repeat offenders. It includes jail sentences for violent offenders. We can't be tough enough on this, and we have to include, for the low-level offenses, some inclusion of education. It's critical and it's important to break that cycle. Our next question comes from Taylor Eubanks. He is the student government president at Coastal Carolina University in Conway, South Carolina. Taylor is a senior political science major from Lyman, South Carolina in Spartanburg County. And your question is for Senator Shaheen. I'd like to first thank uh, both of the candidates for being here this evening and thank Francis Marion for having us. Um, as a representative of Coastal Carolina University, I'm very concerned with the future of higher education in this state. Um, as governor, what are your plans to, to address the various funding requests and issues that revolve around the colleges and universities in this state? Thank you very much for your question, and I thank you very much for being here today, and I hope that you will remain in South Carolina as well upon graduation. Uh, I have some specific elements that I think can be followed in the future. Number one, over the next four years, as our budget increases, as we see revenue growth, as the economy turns around, we have to commit a higher percentage of that to higher education. It is critical. Over 10 years, we've seen that support steadily decline. I also think we need to have a more coherent system of higher education. It makes no sense to me that classes that are taken at one public colleges can't be transferred to another public colleges. Many can, but some can't. We need to streamline that process. We also need to have an empowered higher education commission, a commission that actually has the ability to do long-range planning, to do, uh, put into place plans along with the colleges and universities that will help move us forward in a coherent, strategic manner instead of each college and university going its own way. I think we've seen excellent leadership on the president here and the president at Coastal and the presidents of our major institutions uh, around the state, but I think we have to have leadership from the governor's office to tie it all together and to work with the Commission on Higher Education to really move this state forward. Thanks again for being here and again, stay in South Carolina. Thank you. Ms. Haley. Thank you, Taylor. And you know, the biggest thing we can do for colleges and universities in the state is deregulate them, is not have Columbia tell them how to spend their money. Make sure that they can do whatever they want to do to make it strong. As we're going to have a business plan for higher ed at the state level, each college and university has to have their own business plan. That's why the measurables are so important giving them the money and then at the end of the year asking them in-state versus out-of-state students, graduation rates, dollars in the classroom, and what they did for economic development. Those four measurables will give each school and university stability because they will know that if they hit those achievements, they get more money every year. They will know if they don't hit those uh, achievements that they will be challenged and incentivized. It will also allow us to give bragging rights. The focus on higher ed will come when the trust of the taxpayer is back in their hands. Once they can show where their dollars are going, then the state will be more likely to give them more money and there will be trust in a relationship between the taxpayer and the university again. All right, thank, thank you. you, Ms. Haley. Thank you to Taylor. Robert Kittle has the next question for Senator Shaheen. Senator, as we all know, South Carolina has a lot of problems, a lot of them interrelated from poverty to unemployment, high crime. What do you think is the biggest single problem facing our state and what would you do about it? I think the biggest single problem is the unemployment rate in South Carolina. We historically had a fairly low unemployment rate. For about 25 years, we were at or below the national average with, with a slight aberration during that time. Over the last seven years under this administration, we have seen an incredible spike in the unemployment. Let me tell you why it's the most important issue. Because we won't have the funds to fund public education. We won't have the funds to do the necessary core functions of state government. And we won't have people who are successful in their private lives unless we have jobs. My commitment to this state is that the next governor, me, Vincent Jean, will spend his time recruiting jobs and industry into South Carolina. When I look at all the many problems we have, and we have many, 
We have poverty that's higher than the national average. Uh, we have tuition costs for higher education that is higher than the state, at, uh, the southeastern average, the highest in the southeast. We have many issues relating to crime. We have many issues in South Carolina. There's one thing I've learned over the last year and a half as I've traveled from the low country to the upstate and from Ori to Aiken. The one thing I've learned is that people in this state still believe we can do it. And if we believe we can do it and we have a leader with the vision who can bring us together, we can do it. I'm going to be that type of governor. But we can do it again, ladies and gentlemen. We can do it again. Ms. Haley? Robert, I talked to a company and they said that they interviewed 100 people. And of the 100 people they interviewed, half of them could not read or write properly. Of the half that were left, half of them failed drug tests. We have a cultural problem in South Carolina that we have to acknowledge. The way we will do that is we're always going to work on economic development bringing jobs, but we've got to work on what are the cultural issues that we have in the state. And that is why you will see me bring in a huge faith-based coalition. We will have a statewide community plan on how we're going to go into these poverty-stricken areas. And we will go in there and we will do tutoring programs. We will do preschool programs. We will do mentoring programs and job shadowing programs. This is about making sure that people see something they don't see right now. This is when someone's unemployed and they're going through a hard time, they are going to have a community there ready to help them. When some child is there and they see it's something at home that's not successful, we're going to have a mentor to show them what they can be. When we've got someone who's having a hard time, we're going to make sure that we have that, but it will be through that faith-based organization that we will do that to really tackle the cultural problems we've got in the state. Thank you, Ms. Haley. Jackie Torx, next question is to Representative Haley. Uh, yeah, the State Ethics Commission has said you didn't have to disclose a $42,500 contract you got for consulting work, and you didn't at first. How do you reconcile this action with your calls for income disclosures from every state legislator? You know, I was not someone that was groomed for politics. I had not planned on doing this all my life. And so when I had come into the legislature, I noticed that there were a lot of voice votes. And for two years, I was part of those voice votes. But then I realized that there was a lot of wasteful spending and legislators weren't putting their names with their votes. So I pushed to get legislators to start voting on the record. The same thing happened with income disclosures. Every year, I would sit down with an ethics attorney and say, do I, which of this does it, do I need to disclose? I always disclosed what was appropriate. The Ethics Commission will tell you I did no wrongdoing. But when I saw how much every legislator had to go through that, again, that was a wrong that I saw needed to be right. So I issued a bill that said every legislator should have to disclose their income, not their dollar amount, but they should at least have to disclose their sources of income because two things would happen. One, legislators would know when to recuse themselves from votes they shouldn't be taking. And two, I felt like South Carolina policy would start to move in a way that helped the people and businesses of this state and not the pockets of the legislators. I will still tell you that while I went ahead and disclosed income I didn't have to disclose after I filed that bill, Senator Shaheen has yet to disclose his clients. And he says that he does doesn't have to do that or lawyers shouldn't have to do that, but in Congress, every lawyer discloses their clients and that's something that I think should happen. It's a good way of seeing exactly what those resources are. So what you saw me do was I saw wrong and I made it right, very much like I saw voice votes um, were causing a problem in the state and I've pushed and I'm proud to say that now we have recorded votes on the record. Mr. Shaheen. You know, what's most troubling is that Nikki Haley in a debate with Gresham Barrett at the end of the primary was asked. Have you disclosed all of your income? Because I've heard you might have had done some work for Wilbur Smith. And she said, I've disclosed it all. She looked in the camera and said that. It wasn't true. And five days later, on the day of that election, she released that she had earned that money from Wilbur Smith. I've released 10 years of my tax returns. 10 years of my tax returns. Representative Haley has not given a copy of her tax return to anybody. She let the media come in and look at them and take notes. I cannot disclose all the clients that I have in South Carolina because I'd get disbarred, and Representative Haley knows that as well. <laughs> what is public record is any, any dollars that she has talked about tonight uh, that in any way involve state government, the Blackmans here tonight, who deserve to have good lawyers. I think it's important that we do what we say. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shaheen. Rusty Ray's next question is to Senator Shaheen. Senator, we're going to talk about crime, I guess, one more time. Each year, statistics rank communities like Florence and Sumter, among others, as having some of the highest per capita crime and violent crime rates in the nation. What can you do, what could you do, do you think, as governor, to try to help 
fight crime in the smaller cities and communities in South Carolina and perhaps raise community awareness about prevention of those crimes. You know, for a time I was a prosecutor in one of those small cities in Camden, South Carolina, and I can tell you that over the long term we have to beef up our police forces. Right now we are operating our highway patrol on numbers that were there decades ago or at least a decade ago. Uh, we have a difficult budget crunch right now, but we have to commit to at least maintaining law enforcement this year and then growing the number of officers in the long term. I also think that we need to begin to look at other alternative sentencing programs for nonviolent offenders. Right now it costs you and I and the taxpayers of South Carolina an incredible amount of money to lock up a nonviolent offender. I want to make sure that if we have somebody who's addicted to drugs and hasn't committed any violence offenses, that we have alternative programs like drug courts that can help them uh, beat their problems while punishing them and while also saving the taxpayers' dollars. Violent criminals have to be put away. They have to be put away and the sentences should be tough. We need more law enforcement out there. I've worked closely with law enforcement. We'll continue to do so as the next governor. Ms. Haley. I have always said that government was intended to secure the rights and freedoms of the people. We have got to make sure that we give a, our sheriffs and our law enforcement everything they need. That is a priority in South Carolina. That is a part of the budget we can't cut. We shouldn't cut. We shouldn't make sure. We shouldn't see it drop. We've got to strengthen them. We've got to give them what they need. This is about safety. This is about them being able to do their jobs and being able to strengthen them. So I will maintain a strong relationship with our sheriff's departments, strong relationship with our law enforcement teams and fire departments and all those to make sure that that safety is in place and that's one thing that we never compromise on. Time now for our final voice of the voter question. Kevin Benton asked, with Republicans letting the economy slide in the ditch and Democrats then driving it down further, why should we trust either of those parties? Both make promises, neither have delivered. For this question, both candidates will have a minute and 30 seconds to answer. And Representative Haley, uh, what do you say to voters like Kevin who have lost faith in their government? I think Kevin is right. I think both parties have let him down. I think the Republicans made mistakes, and I think the Democrats made mistakes. And I think through that, the birth of the Tea Parties came. And I have said the Tea Parties aren't a party at all. They're Republicans, Democrats, and Independents who have said they have had enough. And I think that's an amazing thing. What I love to see is that as we go across the state, as you look across this country. I have never seen people more spirited about their government and elected officials so scared. It's a beautiful thing. It needs to stay that way. That is the way we will make sure that it is accountable to the people. That is what my movement has always been about, making sure elected officials are accountable to the people they serve, making sure government knows the value of a dollar, and making sure jobs in the economy come first. I think it's something that we owe it to Kevin. I think it's something that we owe to the people of the state in this country. And I think it's why we're seeing the excitement and the spirit come alive again from the people as they find the power of their voice. Mr. Shaheen, why do you think uh people have lost faith in government? Thank or do you, you think they have? Well, thank you, Kevin. I was, Kevin, I agree with what Kevin said. Uh, and I don't want anybody to vote for me because I'm a Democrat. And I don't want anybody to vote for Nikki Haley because she's a Republican. At the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, we have to vote for people because they are good leaders. Why are we disillusioned in South Carolina? We had a treasurer that went to jail for drug dealing. We had an agricultural secretary that went to jail for bribery. We had a governor who has pled no contest to 60 ethics violations. Who wouldn't be disillusioned? Who wouldn't be disappointed? I've lived in this state my whole life. I grew up in a small community. I've traveled around South Carolina over the last year and a half. These people who have been running South Carolina are not the people that I know in South Carolina. I will be a leader that we can trust in this state again. I am tired of being the butt of late night television jokes. I know you are too. South Carolina deserves so much better than we have had from our leadership over these last few years. My goal is to restore integrity and trust in the leaders of South Carolina. And Kevin hit the nail on the head. Senator, with all due respect, you, you know, left I'm Alvin, pretty Alvin sure, Green I'm pretty off sure that, that we had. I'm pretty sure that we had uh, one minute to answer that question? What was that a minute was 30? A minute 30, thank you. And I didn't interrupt you, and I appreciate you not interrupting me. Time now for the candidates' closing statements. You each have two minutes for your closing statement, and we'll start with Representative Nikki Haley. You know, first of all, I want to thank you for having me here today. It is hard to believe that it's been 18 months, and it's hard to believe we're down to a week. But there is a real decision to be made. You know, as we came through the primary, I went across the state, 
And I said, if you think government should be accountable for a dollar, if you think that elected officials need to remember who it is that they work for, and if you think jobs in the economy should come first, then join our movement. And I always said, but if you join our movement, don't ever make it about a person. Don't ever make it about an election. Make it about what we're going to do in January. You have a clear choice coming up in January. This is about what our state and our country is going to do going forward. This is about saying no to Obamacare, no to mandatory health care that we can't sustain, and saying yes to a governor that will fight every step of the way all the way to the Supreme Court. This is about saying no to stimulus packages and bailouts that we don't need, and a governor who says yes to the fact that we will bring fiscal discipline back to our state house. we will make sure we never take any federal packages that only run up the unemployment and raise the debt. This is about saying no to lawyer legislators that sue businesses for a living and yes to an accountant and a business person who understands the struggles that every business goes through every single day and will work hard to strengthen their bottom line. This is about saying no to the status quo political insider hierarchy and saying yes to real people who know what it's like to have common sense and say the people deserve to have the power of their voice again and have the power to be able to take over their government again. This is an exciting time in our state and our country. We are going through tough times, but I will make sure that we have a 10-year business plan. We will look and see what South Carolina wants to be when it grows up, and we will have a state that's proud. But my goal is that everybody look back at South Carolina and say that's how you do it. So please join our movement, and I ask for your vote today. Thank you. Senator Vincent Shaheen, you have two minutes. Thank you. It has been an honor to be with you, and I thank you again for hosting this debate, and I thank the voters of South Carolina for listening. I ask for your support and your vote next Tuesday. You know, I'm not looking for a movement. I'm finally looking for a governor. We need one again in South Carolina. I want to be that governor for you, a governor that you can trust. This is about having government that we can trust again. I've been honest with the state of South Carolina, and I will be as your governor. We're really at a crossroads, and the question is, are we gonna continue to do what we've done for the last eight years? The eight years of Mark Sanford and Nikki Haley? The eight years of division and distrust and embarrassment and scandal? We don't need a governor who doesn't pay her taxes on time. We don't need a governor who will say something that's completely not true. We need a governor who will once again make us proud. It's written in the book of Proverbs that without a vision, the people perish. I believe that's what's happened in South Carolina. And my vision is of a governor who once again will travel this nation and the state to recruit jobs and industry into South Carolina. It is of, of a governor who's proud to be a public school graduate, who wants to make sure that we focus on the classroom and make sure that our teachers are paid at least as good as surrounding states, and we have discipline in our classrooms, and we have smaller class sizes. We have to take some basic steps to get government working again. We have to make sure we consolidate state agencies and combine programs because we can't afford the government that South Carolina had four years ago. At the end of the day, four years from now, you will look at me and I will make you proud. And I will always tell you the truth. Thank you, good night, and God bless you all. I got a quick question for each of you. Do you like each other? <laughs> yes. I used to. <laughs> <laughs> It has been a contentious race, certainly, but we only have one more week to go. Senator Vincent Shaheen from Camden, Representative Nikki Haley from Lexington, we thank you so much for being with us tonight. To our media panel, also to the Student Government Association presidents for both Francis Marion University and Coastal Carolina University, we also thank you as well for submitting those questions. We thank uh, our Voice of the Voter uh, viewers and readers and subscribers also for submitting questions for tonight's debate. We also want to express, and we can give a big round of applause to Dr. Fred Carter here at Francis Marion University, who's done a great job. And let's not leave out the president of Coastal Carolina University, Dr. David Vicenzo.
Both universities and both university presidents have been instrumental in putting on these series of debates during the primary and also here during the general election. Finally, to our viewers, we say this. You've heard from the candidates. You've heard a lot tonight from the two gubernatorial candidates. Now it's time to have your voice heard. Be a part of your government, exercise your rights, and vote in next Tuesday's election. From Francis Marion University in Florence, South Carolina, my name's Bob Juback. Have a great night, and please vote on Tuesday. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.